Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Thank you as always uh, for stopping by. I'm always grateful. Um, it was a real pleasure to mark the occasion of the Royal Wedding and uh, the High Commissioner's uh, Nick Haley. Um, and he made some wonderful remarks and some quite hard hitting ones about corruption as well. But it was a super party and I uh, really appreciated the invitation. We also, on the same day, hosted uh, the marathon at Eliud Kipchoge. We're in the edit suite right now. He said so many things. He's kind of a philosopher runner. He said, my training is seven days. Every day I do 30 to 40 kilometers. I do pure speed, speed endurance. The heart is what drives the person, he said. Um, and indeed, he was fantastic, I must say. Macro thoughts, 30 years, this is the 30 year bond. Look at this chart, a break of that level is clearly going to be of some import and signaling we're probably headed higher with regard to US interest rates. Home thoughts, an insane view of the Milky Way from the edge of New Zealand, this is by Wired. He nabbed this particular shot of the bay on a still clear night in February was about 3.30 a.m. the tide was going out and the Milky Way was just beginning to rise in the eastern sky. And then this from Will BL, Leopard photographed with a Camtraptions DSLR camera trap. And I've kind of become obsessed with tigers of late and watching all these wonderful documentaries that we have on YouTube. Um, the big cats are really extraordinary creatures. The road between Limuru and Kimende is so surreal. This was a very dark and foreboding morning we had. We were getting a lot of rain here. Venezuelan elections, Nicolas Maduro wins a second term. I want to say good morning to Venezuela. I have been one of the first voters of the homeland. Today we build the future, a hug of hope. If you give me victory, he said, I will defeat the economic war, he roared at his final campaign event. Have a look at this from the Queen of Charts, the Venezuela Bloomberg Cafe Con Leche Index. And essentially, as I said in 2015, and I was quoting Hunter S. Thompson with regard to um, uh, Venezuela, and I said, the age, there is no honest way to explain it, because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who have gone over. And I think essentially Venezuela has gone over. What a scene. Putin greets Merkel with flowers. She greets him in German. He speaks it. Medvedev says hi and Merkel starts speaking some Russian with him. Very interesting video. Must watch. Then a very hard-hitting interview with Robert Fisk who's been denigrated unfairly, but he's actually one of the few journalists who's reported honestly from the Middle East for a long period of time. He's worth listening to, even if you disagree with him. China, and this story got sort of lost. China has landed nuclear strike capable bombers on the South China Sea Islands. This is the Paracel Islands. The location of H6K test is Woody Island, part of the Paracels. Um, and uh, Business Insider concludes, it's a, in a clear sign that it's pushed out the US without firing a shot. Nearly all of the Philippines falls within the radius of the bombers, including Manila. And this goes back to a piece I wrote in August 2017, China Rising, and I said, apart from a few half-hearted and timid FONOPs, freedom of navigation operations, China has established control over the South China Sea. It has created artificial islands and then militarized those artificial islands across the South China Sea. It is a mind-boggling geopolitical advance any which way you care to cut it. And this is even a further extension of that. And a bold one, under cover of this tariff war, Chinese bombers, including the H-6K conduct takeoff and landing training on an island reef at a southern sea area, reports the People's Daily China. The Paracels is also claimed by Vietnam and Taiwan. 
Uh, and essentially, I agree with Dan Hickey that it's essentially pushed the US out of the South China Sea without firing a shot. Donald Trump may be preparing for the wrong game, a two-player round of checkers when Kim is stealing for a multiplayer two-board chess match. I think that's true as well, foreign affairs. Trump Jr. and other aides met with Gulf emissary offering help to win the elections. One was an Israeli specialist in social media manipulation. Another one was an emissary for two wealthy Arab princes. The third was a Republican donor with a controversial past in the Middle East as a private security contractor. The firm had already drawn up a multi-million dollar proposal for a social media manipulation effort to help elect Mr. Trump. And essentially, this goes back to the article I wrote in December 2016 when I said we have a deviate tomahawk, clearly we do. Um, uh, they've used uh, foreign power help uh, to win that election, that's of no doubt. Yesterday, Muqtada Sadr invited ambassadors of countries with borders with Iraq, um, Iraq, Saudi, Jordan, Kuwait, Syria, and Turkey. The Iranian ambassador declined to attend because the Saudi ambassador was there. Look, a few things I've got to say. Muqtada was a real firebrand in the old days at the time of the invasion. They at one time wanted to kill him dead, but he survived, and here he is, he's the kingmaker. And in this, he's seen meeting with Pierre Mabadi, hinting at a coalition. While Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump party, Palestinians were being gunned down for daring to protest for their right to return to lands they were expelled from. Israel, this is the intercept, Jeremy Scahill, who's saying it how it is. Israel has once again conducted a premeditated, full-scale massacre in broad daylight in front of the cameras of the world. Once again, it took place in Gaza. On May 14, Israeli snipers and other forces gunned down more than 60 Palestinians and wounded thousands of others, including civilians, journalists and paramedics. You try non-lethal means and they don't work, said Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, so you're left with bad choices. It's a bad deal, you know. You try, you go for below the knee, and sometimes it doesn't work, he said. And unfortunately, these things are avoidable. I think it's as clear as the Sharpville massacre was. You either fall on the right side or the wrong side in this matter. And also, I think it's not sustainable. This is a society on the edge. Where it will go from here is anybody's guess. And it's not going to be advantageous now for Israel to to rub people's noses into the ground at this point. Mohammed bin Syed tweeted this photograph. International markets, my piece over the weekend was titled Blockchain, Cryptocurrencies and Avocados. Let's start with the basics. New economies tend to create their own lingua francas. And before you know it, we might be nodding sagely, but have become essentially clueless. And if we don't Uberize ourselves, we might end up being Kodak. Kodak, however, seeking to resurrect themselves from the smartphone, camera phone catastrophe by issuing a Kodak coin. The first term to understand is the blockchain. The blockchain is a continuously growing list of records called blocks, which are linked and secured using cryptography. Each block typically contains a cryptographic hash of the previous block, timestamp and transaction data. By design, a blockchain is inherently resistant to modification of the data. It is an open distributed ledger that can record transactions between two parties efficiently and in a verifiable and permanent way. For use as a distributed ledger, a blockchain is typically managed by a peer-to-peer -peer network collectively adhering to a protocol for internode communication and validating new blocks. Once recorded, the data in any given block cannot be altered retroactively without the alteration of all subsequent blocks, which requires collusion of the network majority. Blockchains are secure by design and exemplify a distributed computing system with high Byzantine fault tolerance. Decentralized consensus has therefore been achieved with a blockchain this makes blockchains potentially suitable for the recording of events, medical records, other records management activities, 
such as identity management, transaction processing, um, food traceability or voting. Blockchain was invented by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008 for use in the cryptocurrency Bitcoin as its public transaction ledger. The invention of the blockchain for Bitcoin made it the first digital currency to solve the double spending problem without the need of a trusted authority or central server. This means specific blockchain applications may be a disruptive innovation because substantially lower cost solutions can be instantiated, which can disrupt existing business models. Blockchain protocols facilitate businesses to use new methods of processing digital transactions. Examples include a payment system and digital currency, facilitating crowd sales and generic governance tools. Here in Kenya, the application of the blockchain to the land register is a no-brainer. The land register would metasize from a situation where it has more holes than Swiss cheese to one where it is 100% tamper-proof. I have no doubt that the blockchain is a silver bullet, but the question is how long the incumbents can dodge the bullet. The second term to understand is cryptocurrency. A cryptocurrency is a digital asset designed to work as a medium of exchange that uses cryptography to secure its transactions, to control the creation of additional units, and to verify the transfer of assets. Cryptocurrencies are a type of digital currency, alternative currency, and virtual currency. Cryptocurrencies use decentralized control as opposed to centralized electronic money in central banking systems. The decentralized control of each cryptocurrency works through a blockchain, which, as we know, is a public transaction database. Bitcoin, created in 2009, was the first decentralized cryptocurrency. Since then, over 3,500 cryptocurrencies have been created, if not more. The entire cryptocurrency market was valued at $5.5 billion in January 2015, $7.152 billion in January 2016, $18.34 billion in January 2017, $795.83 billion in January 2018, $249.15 billion on April the 4th this year, last valued at $379.83 billion. The price inflation witnessed between January 2017, $18.34 billion, which I might add, was when I put a buy note out on Bitcoin, and January 2018, when it was valued at $795.83 billion, was the fastest price increase ever witnessed in the history of mankind, even surpassing the tulip mania of 400 years ago. At today's prices, cryptocurrency trades 24 hours a day, seven days a week, unlike the ordinary markets which take the weekend off. Bitcoin constitutes 37.38% of the entire cryptocurrency value, Ethereum 18.49%, Ripple 7.02%, Bitcoin Cash 5.37%, Litecoin 2.03%, IOTA 1.3%, 3.2%, NEO 1.03%, and all the others 24.95%. Now, when you see price inflation of the type cryptocurrency markets have witnessed, it of course creates a fever of speculation and a whole series of high-tech pump and dump schemes. In the cryptocurrency markets, it's a serious case of caveat emptor. At least 95% of the current crop of cryptocurrencies are going to be worth zero. The winners will produce an exponential parabolic return. Go remember that quote to the parabola. To be a winner, the cryptocurrency needed to be first, like Bitcoin, which has a limited and finite number and therefore remains as a scarcity value and maintain your credibility as the preeminent crypto because Bitcoin is no longer about utility. For example, the block time for Ethereum is set uh, between 14 and 15 seconds, while for Bitcoin it is 10 minutes. The rise of Ethereum is exactly around its utility and its platform. It is the preeminent digital capital markets platform for the crypto markets. Ripple is seeking to disrupt the global wholesale money transfer markets. Let me leave you with one final thought, and that is about velocity 
Paul Virilio, speed now illuminates reality, whereas light once gave objects of the world their shape. Benedict Evans tweeted yesterday, the difference in tech is that the cycle time can be really fast. We went from IBM to Wintel to Gaffer in 20 year jumps. That has tended to mean dominance turns to irrelevance faster than antitrust processes can diagnose, pick a remedy and apply it. Hamid Rashid, the CEO of Fintera Blockchain, said to me, Ali Khan, what took a decade to happen is happening in months in this new blockchain crypto economy. And on that closing note, I'm going to have an avocado, which seems to be what a lot of folks are going to do these days. Bitcoin's volatility over the last 30 days is down to 69%, the lowest since last October, Charlie Villello. These are cryptocurrency returns in 2018, again, it's from Charlie. Bitcoin has gone 153 days without a new high. The longest streak ever was 1,176. Charlie again. The 15-week symmetrical triangle is now the dominant classical chart construction in Bitcoin. The resolution of this configuration will determine the next significant trend. Peter Brent, who I follow. And then, as I said, that quote about speed now illuminates reality where light once gave objects of the world their shape is, of course, from Paul Virilio. Let's move on to the currency markets, which continue to see significant movement. Euro dollar, 117.40. Dollar index, 93.83. Japanese yen, 111.31. I think it's going to 114.50. Swiss just below one. The pound, 134, the figure. The Australian dollar, where is that? 0.7525. That's getting a little bit of a bounce. Indian rupee 68.125 under pressure, nearing a record low. South Korean 1186.98. The real 373.82. Egyptian pound 17.9418. That's softening up as well. And the rand hits a five month low, 1288.01. The dollar index, about which I've been bullish all year, you remember I even was tested and I stuck with the 88 stock, is currently at 93.83. My near term target is 94.50. Euro dollar, this chart is from T Commodity. We're now at 117.38. My target looks like 114.50 now. Gold, that's another thing that's wobbled, 1284.50. Strong dollar putting pressure on gold. Oil, that's actually trading higher. In New York, we're at $71.62. Brent has crossed 80. The swings and the price of oil have been massive during the last 15 years. This is a chart from James Blockland. Emerging markets, Harvard's Reinhardt says emerging markets are in a tougher spot than during the 2008 crisis. Uh, have a look at that link. As I said on the 14th of May, this has all the ingredients for baking a good old-fashioned crisis. And the signal in the noise is the yield on 10-year treasuries, uh, which was around 3% when I wrote that article. And I said, if we go to 35 it's going to be absolute bloodletting and carnage. Local currency bonds are bearing the brunt of the emerging market route. They could get completely slaughtered if we fall, you know, if we see yields rise further. EM crisis spreading, Argentina pesos dropped another 5% last week. Um, of course, they incredibly sold a century bond just last year, but have now dialed up Madame Lagarde. Turkish route continues, Turkish 10-year yields rise to a record of 15%, the currency collapsed to a fresh record low. Let's move on to Africa. Changes at the DR Congo's constitutional court fuel fears that the country's leader may seek another term doesn't want to go, does he? The aftermath of Cyclone Saga this morning, this is yesterday in Djibouti City, there were rains all along that Horn of Africa area, and quite strong ones. Um, and here too, we're expecting heavy rain. South African oil shares down 2.86% year to date, dollar rand at a five month low, 1288.01. Still bullish about it, but you know, who knows where we're going right now. Egyptian pound is lost at 17.9418. Nigeria's economy grew just 1.95% year on year in the first quarter, which was slower than expected. Um, uh, Bloomberg consensus was 2.6%. Oil led the way with the non-oil sector barely growing at 0.76%. 
Nigerian all shares up 5.83% this year. Ghana Stock Exchange is up 31.18% this year. Ebola deaths have risen to 26, says Congo Health Ministry. And as I said previously, it's all about escape velocity. The numbers might look small, but they can expand at an exponential and parabolic rate. These viruses exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics. Kenyan investigators have summoned more than 40 people for questioning after a massive theft of public funds at the NYS. Train ferrying fuel plunged into the sea in Changamwe in Mombasa. Police closed the Changamwe Mombasa road indefinitely. Airport and SGR users had been affected. That was yesterday. Sassini Tea and Coffee reported first half earnings per share increased 8.8242%. First half revenue was up 3.533%. Profit before tax was up 12.416%. Um, EPS was up 8.824% at 37 cents, but they're paying a dividend of 50 cents, which is interesting. Um, production is, of course, set to surge in the second half. The shilling has appreciated 2.7% against the dollar year to date um, and has proven very uh, muscular in point of fact. Nairobi all shares up 4.7% year to date, down 8.8% and setting a record high on April the 5th. I attended the bell ringing ceremony for Afric, Af, Afric Invests Investment in Britain. Um, they've completed a share subscription of 14.3% of the equity of Britain. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Benson Myregi said we've raised 15.2 billion shillings, that's $152 million via African, African Invest's share subscription. IFCs also subscribe for shares and a bond that they issued. Um, here I'm seen having a quick chat with the Peter Munger, the chairman of um, uh, Equity Bank, and quite a personality. George in this video explains who African Invest are. Um, on the occasion of the bell ringing. The NEC 20 is down 5.87%. Um, it would be remiss of me not to thank uh, Mr. Odundo, the CEO of the NSC, for the shout out he gave me. I appreciate it thoroughly. And that's it for today. Thank you for stopping by.